Good morning, church. So great to be with you all this morning. Today's message, we're talking about expecting God to be good. Expecting God to be good. There was a woman who was taking a flight and she walked up on the airplane and there was a fellow already in the seat where she was going to be, but she sat down next to him and she sat down for a few minutes and the flight took off and she brought her Bible with her and she pulled out her Bible and started reading in it and the guy was kind of looking over at her and kind of curious and he's, what are you reading anyways? And she said, well, I'm actually reading my Bible. And he says, you don't really believe that thing, do you? And she said, well, yeah, why wouldn't I? And he said, well, what about that guy and the big fish? She's like, you talking about Jonah? He said, yeah, Jonah. He said, how do you explain that? A guy living in the belly of a fish for three, three days. And she goes, well, you know, I don't really know all the explanations, but when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. And he said, well, what if he didn't go to heaven? And she says, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> Sometimes I just need to laugh. I don't know about you. This year, 2017, I've seen a lot of good things, but at the same time, would anybody agree that this has been a year that's had a lot of trials? Yeah, it's had a lot of testing, there's been a lot of difficulty. And what can happen is if you have, go through a series of trials, Joyce Meyer describes it as evil foreboding. You kind of get to the point where you're almost like you live life like, well, what's next? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. You just start to anticipate bad things. You start to anticipate what's going to be the next terrible event, what's going to be the next trial, what's going to be the next bad thing that happens. Am I alone here? Uh, you just almost end up like Eeyore with the cloud over your head, anticipating bad. <clears throat> and what can happen is we can lose our expectation of the goodness of God and start to expect bad things. But what God is trying to say to us this morning is, I know it's been tough. I know there's been a lot of trials. But the thing you may be forgetting is that God isn't finished yet. God is here to say to Cornerstone this morning, I know it's been a tough year, but if you notice, the year's not over. And God is not done yet. He is at doing a great work, and there may have been a lot of disappointments and setbacks and heartbreaks, but the one thing we cannot lose is our expectation of the goodness of God. We cannot forget because of our circumstances who our God is. In James 1.17, he says this, he says, every good gift and every perfect gift... It's not only a blessing, His gifts, but listen, it's perfect. It shows up right on time, in just the right way, just when you need it. Hallelujah. Every perfect gift is from where? Above, church. It comes down from the Father of lights. He's the one that looked in the darkness and said, what church? Let there be light. And with whom there is no variation or what? Shadow of turning as the earth spins, the shadow moves, it changes, but our God is constant. He does not change. Just because circumstances are difficult does not change His goodness. It does not change His plan to bless you. In Matthew 7, 11, Jesus said, if you then being evil, turn to your neighbor and say, that part's about you. <laughs> you know how to give good gifts to your children. This next part's about all of us. It's God's will towards us. How much more will your Father in Heaven do what? Give good things to those who ask Him. That's a promise for all of us this morning. Amen? If, if I, being sinful, know how to want to bless my boy this morning because it's his birthday, I just, I'm so excited about it. God is infinitely more excited about us. He's an infinitely better father than I could ever aspire to be. He is my role model. Proverbs 13.12 tells us this, Hope deferred makes 
the heart sick. This morning, I believe this is a verse that just rings true for this place. We are in a time period of waiting. And during that time period of waiting, the trial is this, of whether I'll let my heart get sick from the waiting. See, the word hope, listen, if you're taking notes, the word hope in the Bible means the expectation of God's goodness. Did you know that? It it doesn't mean wishful thinking like the world talks of hope. It means I know God is good and He's going to come through. The Bible says the farmer plants in expectation. He doesn't walk out the next morning and say, well, there's no corn, I might as well give up. He plants with expectation, anticipation, that he is sure that that plant is going to come up, it's going to grow, and it's going to bear fruit. Amen? And see what happens with our hope, if it goes on, if it gets deferred, if we're not careful, we can become the farmer who walks out after two days and says, well, there's no harvest, I might as well quit. But notice what he says in the next phrase, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. How many trials have you been through in your life? You can't number them. But let me ask you the next question. How many of them has God already brought you through? The desire fulfilled is a tree of life. If you're discouraged, look back on all the answered prayers you've already had. All the trials He's already brought you through. All the things He's already done. God's goodness has not changed in this trial. This trial may be harder. It may seem longer. The valley may seem deeper. But our God is still good. And when you realize that the desire is coming, listen, it's a tree of life. You feed on the goodness of God, on the answered prayers in your life. See, what we need to learn is how to wait when God seems late. Jesus says this, You didn't choose me. I chose you. I picked you out on purpose. And he goes on to say, not only I picked you, but then I appointed you. I have an appointment for you. He says to what? Go bear fruit. Jesus has an appointment for you. But what can happen is if we let our hope get deferred and we get down inside, we can allow our disappointment to get in the way of our divine appointment. And we have to learn to wait when it seems like in our timing that God is late. And listen, I don't know about you, but I don't want to let any disappointment get between me and my divine appointment of God's blessing, God's plan. Hallelujah. God has a plan for this place. He has a plan for your life. Fruit bearing takes time. And the farmer waits with anticipation, no matter what the trial, and I preached a couple months ago this, you can look at time after time where it talks about difficulties and trials, and it follows up with the phrase, but God. And God makes all the difference. How many of y'all want to walk into your but God moment? You want to move past the disappointment to the divine appointment. You want to move through the trial to the triumph. Do I have anybody here today? then the first thing we've got to do, number one, is to begin to expect God to be good again. We have to start to expect His goodness. Psalm 119 says this in verse 68. Speaking of God, He says, You are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. Look, He says, God, you are good. He doesn't just say you do good. In fact, what He's saying is, God does good things because goodness is who He is. And I've preached here before about the goodness of God, and I know people don't get it, because they'll say to me, well, Pastor, isn't God great? Well, He's great too. But His greatness is talking about His power. His goodness is speaking of His character. I need a great God, a God that's all-powerful. But you know what touches my heart even more? God's heart. I love it that He's all-powerful, but what gets me is this, He's all-loving. When I say God's good, I mean this. He has perfect love. He's perfectly merciful. He's perfectly forgiving. He's perfectly committed to you. Is somebody getting this this morning? That your Father is good from the heart out. When He does good things, it's because He couldn't hold back. It's because it's who He is. 
When God's good, it isn't Him stepping out of His typical role. It's simply Him acting out who He is from the heart. He's wanting to bless you. God is good and He does good. Psalm 86, 5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive. I'm thankful for that. I don't know about you. And abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Church, let's begin to celebrate the goodness of God. Let's begin to celebrate the character, the love, the mercy, the forgiveness of God. I believe the church has been so obsessed with God being all powerful, it's forgotten that the most important thing is that He's all loving. It was His love that drove Him to the cross. It was His love that drove Him to die on the cross for our sins. Is somebody awake here this morning? I'm telling you this morning, I know you think God can. But I'm telling you, not only He can, but He will. It's not if God moves, it's only when. Acts 10.38, there's no more perfect example of who God is than in Acts 10.38. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And notice this. Who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with Him. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. He's God made flesh. He didn't go around doing terrible things. He went around doing good. I may be upsetting some of your all's apple carts in your theology. Sounds good to me. Our culture needs it. You look in your insurance, it talks about anything bad happening. You know what they call it? An act of... I'm here to tell you, read the creation story. It was all good. We're the ones who messed it up. Hallelujah. When you look at heaven... Our destination, it says He wipes away every tear from their eyes. There's no more mourning, no more sickness, no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Our God is good. And He has determined, He chose you, not to just for you to just go through life barely hanging on, but He chose you with an appointment to go be fruitful, to be blessed. Are you hearing me? God's inheritance, listen, His inheritance is connected all to this Word. He's exalted His Word above all, even His name, the Word of God says. Listen, Israel, God promised them a place that they would live. It was so connected to His Word. What did He call it? The promised land. You have a promised land. And I want you to just remember, it's not just a land, it's a land that has been promised Can your God lie? Can your God lie? I need to upset some people's theology. Apparently some of y'all think He's bad, that He lies, and He's doing all the terrible things in your life. I'm here to tell you He's good. He loves you. He's kind to you. He's forgiven to you. He's merciful. He's looking to you saying, will you turn to me this morning? You've been running away when you should have been running to God. Joshua, near the end of his life, he led Israel into their promised land. And notice what he says in verse 14 of Joshua 23. Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. In other words, he's getting ready to die and he knows it. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls, I underline this, that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning You. Not one thing has failed. And he goes on to say, all. Somebody needs to look at their neighbor and say, all means all. Not some, not most. All have come to pass for you. You're looking, but Pastor, you got some attitude. I got some attitude about how good my God is. Thank you very much. I'm not backing down about it. If I didn't know this, I wouldn't be here this morning. I'm going to get to that, by the way. He goes on to say, all have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. And some of us looking, some of you are looking at me like, yeah, Pastor, but, but I've messed it up. I've made mistakes. Well, I tell you what, I've got a club for you. And I'm the president of it. 
And I still believe, however, that my God is bigger than my mistakes. Look at what Paul said in Philippians 1.6. Being confident. The word confident means I am absolutely persuaded of this. I have no doubt of this very thing. That He who has what? Begun a good work in you. Notice it's a good work. Will what? Complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You can't do anything that makes Him give up. He is more determined than you. I found that to be the case. And what happens is this. It grips my heart. Every time He chases me down, I know more and more how good my dad is. And listen, every time He chases me down, I love Him more and more. He has never given up on me. And I've come to know that He never will. Hebrews 6.19 says this hope. Remember what hope is? The expectation of God's goodness. This hope we have is what? An anchor. Anybody here this morning need an anchor? You, got a, you need something that will hold on to you. Did you hear that? I didn't say something for you to hold on to. I said something that will hold on to you. The Scriptures say we are kept by the power of God. Not by me. It's His power that's been keeping me. He's been keeping you too. This hope we have is an anchor for the soul, for the soul both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. Wow. <laughs> it enters the presence behind the veil. Just, just when you're ready to give up, God sends a word <laughs> coming from the throne room. Are you hearing me this morning? Just when you're ready to give up, this certain song comes on from the throne room. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're ready to give up, and all of a sudden He plants a word in your heart that lifts you up. It comes from the throne room. This anchor comes by the fact that the veil is removed and you have been connected to Almighty God. There is no distance for the child of God. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says this, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to Him. He's speaking to a king who had a problem and didn't go to God. He made a foolish mistake. And what he's saying is this, you need to turn to the Lord. He is looking for someone to bless. He's not, he's not picking and choosing winners and losers either. What I found is this, he's looking for people whose hearts are directed towards him. I want you to hear something. He doesn't say here he's looking for perfect people. He's looking for people whom their heart is oriented towards God. And what happens is this, is I have two cups. You know the Bible says that God what, sends rain on the just and the unjust? He's sending His blessings to all of us. But we are in a season, I believe, where we can choose whether we will be receivers of the blessing or whether we'll allow our disappointment to make us miss our divine appointment. I have two cups. One is inverted. God can pour out His blessings over this cup and He will, but guess what? Will it ever get full? And I have another cup. Right now it's empty, but guess what? It's turned the right way waiting. And if I begin to pour water out of my cup into these cups, guess what? This one's going to get full. And we're going to become like David who said, what? My cup, it overflows! The same one who'd been walking through the valley of the shadow of death goes on to say, my cup overfloweth! Yeah. Hallelujah. I want to see some people with their cups up high. I want to see a church this morning like this. God, come on. I'm ready. See, listen, you may be looking at your life saying, it just looks impossible. I don't see how God could heal. I don't see how He could handle this situation. Maybe you're facing a, a relationship battle. Even your marriage or with kids or you're trying to see how could this child ever come back to the Lord. Guess what? Get your cup up high. Yeah. Be expecting God to be good. It looks impossible. That's what God loves because then you know it's Him. The second point this morning is to expect God once again to be God. 
That's a good word, by the way. The enemy likes to bring unbelief in the life of a believer and make us forget that our God is God. I've read the end of the book. He gets the final say. Amen? Amen? Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 3.20. Ephesians 3.20. During the second half, I may get excited. I'm warning you ahead of time. If the first half has been dry, I will improve. Ephesians 3.20. Now to Him who is able to do what? Abundantly. Above all. It's like Paul is cramming as many words as he can into one sentence to get it across to us that God is limitless. In other words, it is immeasurable. It is what? It is infinite what He is able to do. Above all that we want, ask, or even think of according to what? The power that's worked somewhere in the universe? Notice this. His power is where? Somebody needs to read that verse again. I don't think you got this. The infinite power of God that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think is already in you. He has deposited His abilities in His people. I might start getting excited now. I can't think of any greater miracle than this. God became flesh. And He dwelt among us. You know, and this began when the angel appeared to a man named Zacharias. Gabriel showed up. Zacharias was a priest. It was his time to offer the incense in the holy place. He's in there all by himself, and all of a sudden, here stands an angel. And Gabriel begins to speak to Zacharias. It says in Luke 1.13, But the angel said to him, to Zacharias, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. I love this. For your prayer is heard. There's power in this. I'm going to come back to it. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. What's interesting about him saying your prayer has been heard is that apparently John had quit praying the prayer for a long time. He had given up. His hope had become deferred. How do we know this? Because he immediately begins to argue with the angel of God about it. He looks at him and says, I'm way too old for this. My wife Elizabeth, she's way past childbearing years. What are you talking about? God wants to surprise you with things you've already given up on. Let that sink in for a moment. The prayer you've quit praying, He still intends to answer. That, wow. Exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that you could ask or think. That's the kind of power he has. And listen, John heard Zacharias is in such an argument, the angel says, you know what? I'm the angel of the Lord. I stand in the presence of God. Um, you're not speaking until this child's born. In other words, I'm going to keep you from getting in the way of your blessing. Did you hear that? <laughs> Some of us get in the way of our own blessing. You may have never heard that before, but listen, your words are what? Death or life? Why do you think the angel had to make John not be able to speak? Anyways, moving on. Some of you all think that was, you'll get that later. Six months later, the same angel shows up and speaks to a young girl. She's probably in her early teens. Her name is Mary. You may have heard of her. It says in verse 34, listen, he tells her, you're going to give birth to the Savior the Son of God. And verse 34 says, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be? Since I do not know a man. She's not saying, God, I don't think you can. I just don't see how this is all going to happen. It's okay to question God as to how, but don't question Him whether He can. Do you see the difference? Zacharias didn't believe he could. Mary's just curious. 
How is this going to happen? And notice the answer, verse 35. God's going to come. It says, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her for who was called barren. Some of you, the enemy has tried to give you the label of barren. Fruitless. God hasn't ignored your prayer. He still has a divine appointment for you. I'm pray- I, sometimes I'm pausing here because I just want these things to soak in. The thing you gave up on, the thing you've almost even forgotten about, that's what He has for you. Are you hearing me? And it's the power of God in you that's going to make it happen. I love the next verse. It's one of my favorite Bible verses, period. For with God, no thing will be impossible. I want you to notice something here. Nothing in the Greek is actually two words. It's the word no, and the second word means spoken word of God. No word that God gives you will be impossible. And the word impossible means without the power to make it happen. Jesus said, my words are what? Spirit and they are life. When God speaks over you, it's not just words, but He releases the power over you with the promise to make it happen. The power comes with the promise. There is a release of power over you. And listen, you will receive it if your cup is up and ready. Every Sunday when I come and preach, I know there's people here like this, but I can't, I can't deny that sometimes there's probably some folks sitting there like this. And listen, during the same sermon, one person's getting their cup, it's overflowing, they're getting blessed, they walk out of this place on fire for God, and another one walks out, oh, I don't even know why I come here. God's not doing anything. He was doing the same thing for you. You just had turned yourself away. Get your cup up this morning. Hallelujah. I love preaching to cups up people. It's fun. It's rewarding. Verse 38. Then Mary said, and I, oh, I want to live this way. Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, in other words, God, I'm all yours. Let it be to me according to your will. Word, in other words, may everything happen in my life just the way you said it would. Anybody here want that? You want what God said to happen verbatim, the exact way that He said it would happen, and it will be right on time. Oh, some of you all need to receive that this morning. Get your cups up this morning. God, let it be according to Your Word in my life. I'm your servant. I'm your follower. I'm your child. And I want everything that you promised over me. I'm open to receive it. This church is open to receive it. Everything He's promised. You remember Joshua? Remember we just read about how he's told Israel how God had fulfilled every word. Every promise. Not one of them had failed. I want to rewind about 20 years earlier when he was getting ready to lead God's people into the promised land. Remember, they had been wandering in the wilderness for how long? Forty years. That's a long time, isn't it? Forty years can make you think, I guess it isn't going to happen. Forty years can get you in a rut. Forty years can get you to be one of these people you used to be excited about God, now you're just going through the motions. You know what I'm talking about? There's a lot of churches... And a lot of church people who've been on a long 40-year journey. And I want you to notice something. He's saying to them, your 40 years is up. Is anybody receiving this this morning? The 40 years, I believe, for God's people is up. He's not speaking this word by accident. Joshua 3.4 says, 
yet there shall be a space between you and it. What's he talking about? They're getting ready to go in the promised land, but guess who's going to lead them? God. And they took the Ark of the Covenant, which is what? Where God's glory dwelt. It's where his word was inside. It's where his promise, his covenant was inside of that ark. And they took the presence of God and put it out front. And they stood at a distance and they just followed God. And God led them to a river. And did the river stop them? The river was nothing, was it? But I want you to remember something. When those priests walked up to the river, did it stop flowing? No. What did they have to do? They had to step into a raging, flooding stream, following God's presence. And when they did, then the waters split wide open. There is a leap of faith between you and your destiny. There's a leap of faith between wandering in the wilderness and stepping into the promised land. Amen? But when we step out, you know what? God shows up instantly. God moves when we move. (laughs) Did you hear that? God works when his people get to work. I've seen it time and time again. It it just excites him. He's like, all right, now their cup is up and they're ready. And notice what he goes on to say. He says there's going to be about 2,000 cubits by measure. That's about 3,000 feet back. Saying about 3,000 feet back and just watch God move and you follow him. He says, don't come near it that you may know the way by which you must go. Why are we going to have to follow God's Spirit? Notice this phrase, and I speak this over every person here and over this church. God is saying to every person here this morning over Cornerstone Community Church, for you have not passed this way before. Forty years of wilderness, done! I'm taking you where you've never been. You never thought possible. You don't know what it's like, but I'll describe it. I'll take you there. I'll make it happen. It's done because God has promised it. And the same God who did it for his people then will do it now. He hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday forevermore. Listen. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow. Or turning. He has not changed. It's just who He is. He can't help but be good. Because it's who He is. It just bubbles out of Him. Psalm 27 says this. I would have lost heart. My hope would have been deferred and I'd have given up unless I had believed. And notice what He believes. That I would see the goodness of the Lord In the land, not in the next life alone, but notice this, in this life, in the land of the living. Is someone hearing this this morning? God is saying, in this life, I'm going to take you into a life of abundance. I'm going to take you into my perfect plan of fruitfulness. It's what I've intended for you. It's what I'm going to do. And so we notice he says in the next verse, it's what we have to learn to do. We have to learn to wait. Did someone hear that this morning? It's not if, it's just when. All you've got to learn to do is wait and not let your hope get deferred and your heart get sick, but stay focused on God and let that tree of life pour into you. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. The word wait means to bind together like a knot with twisting. In other words, as I wait, I keep chasing after God. And He keeps meeting me because He goes behind the veil. And I encounter His presence. And He encourages me. He strengthens me. His strength becomes my strength. His promises become my faith. Oh, I don't know everything. Not even close. But I have been in ministry for a little while. About 14 and a half years. And and it's been amazing. And it's been difficult. And I'd been going through ministry, felt pretty good about it. And about three years ago, I hit a wall that I've never hit. 
And it was this, and I don't know if this will speak to somebody, but I believe it's going to speak to a lot of you. In about one year as a pastor, it just felt like everybody that was in my camp almost split. And, and everybody I thought had my back, they weren't there. You ever felt alone before? It was like, where is everybody? Man, what did I do wrong? You ever question yourself, is there something wrong with me? Did I quit wearing deodorant to church and you couldn't take it anymore? And for some of them, it's just simply they graduated. Their time at Cornerstone was over. And for some of them, they were exasperated. They, they had lost their hope. And, and you know, and, the, and there was a few that just, they, they, they were upset about something. And just, there was just this whirlwind. I just went through this year where everybody, boom, boom, boom. And I'm standing here at the end of the year like, okay, I'm still here. I almost feel alone. I'm not completely alone, but I'm the closest I've ever been. And I'm like, obviously asking God, you know, maybe I'm done too. Would you all ask yourself that if everybody left you? I'm sure you do. It's just natural common sense, right? But how many of you all know God doesn't operate always on natural? He's supernatural. And He's without limitations. And I began to pray. And you know what He did? He lovingly confronted me. He said, the thing that's happened to you, He said, is you've allowed yourself to live below your potential. He's like, I created you to minister and live on this level, and you settled down here. And so I allowed everybody to leave so you would realize it, that you have been staying on this level because it's where you're comfortable, and most importantly this, and I don't know if this ministers to somebody, but it's all the better I thought I could do. I think a lot of us settle at a lower level because we honestly don't think much better of ourselves. You know what I'm talking about? Been beaten down. Discouraged enough. Okay, this just must be God. And to be honest with you, I realized I had given up on my own purpose and was just kind of going through the motions. And this is what he said. He said, I have deposited so much more anointing in you. You just need to let it out now. Everything that you need to get through this trial, everything that this church is going to need, listen, he said, it, it begins if you will step out. It isn't that I have it all, but it has to begin with the pastor. And he can't have a pastor who's going halfway. And listen, I didn't realize I was. It wasn't on purpose. It was by my own discouragement, my hope deferred. Anybody hearing me this morning? My hope deferred. I had allowed my heart to get sick. I had allowed my cup to turn upside down and I didn't even know it. But the moment, listen, that I said, you know what, God, if this is where you want me, this is what you want me to do, you say I can do it, then I can do it. See, with His promise came power. Hallelujah. With, not, with God, nothing shall be impossible. No word will come without the power to make it happen. And He said, you know what? And you know what? The next time I got up to preach, I was like, ooh, what's this anointing? I haven't quite preached this way before. You know what? In essence, I began to face troubles. I began to go to people who had been upset, and they weren't even upset anymore. Did you hear that? I began to step out. The reason I hadn't reconciled with people is because I felt so bad about me. I figured they hated me because I must be hateable. Did you hear that? And I went and found out that they loved me when I showed them love. Come on, church. You've undervalued yourself. You have undervalued the anointing and the calling of God in your life. And God is saying, let it all out. It's time for God's people to be all out there. If you're, a, if you're with a jacket on, get it off. If you got your hair up, let it down. It's time for the church to get up, get moving, get excited, get passionate, get on the move. We haven't gone this way before. 
But we're going that way now. And you know what? I've had since then, I had a renewed passion. I had a renewed purpose. I had a renewed commitment. And listen, my purpose didn't look like it did before. He expanded it. And those of us who think that our dream is past, that God's plan is too late, the thing He's saying is, I'm not only going to do what I told you, but what I told you wasn't even the half of it. I got so much more for you and I didn't tell it to you then because you weren't ready for it. It would have overwhelmed you. You would have been crushed by it. But now it's time. You've been through the trial. You've been through the fire. And Israel said, you took us through fire and we came through water and you brought us out to a place of abundance. It was the testing in the trial that built the character that said, you know, God, no matter what's up, my cup is up. And I'm going to keep it tilted towards you. The church, you know what, since that time, all kinds of things have happened. I've baptized more people in the last two years than I did all the years before, pretty much. Listen, so much has happened because of Him, not because of me. But if we will get lined up with Him, He is going to multiply what He's doing. Oh, we haven't gone this way before. I want to invite our worship team to come forward. They're going to sing about the goodness of God. And God is telling His people, get your cups out and get them up. Amen. And notice this phrase. Begin to do this and begin to live this way. Begin to live in expectation of the goodness of God. Begin to have your life oriented towards that. I don't know when... I don't know how, but I know my dad is good and he's going to work this together for good. It's just a matter of time. It's not if, it's just when. I'm coming through this and I'm coming out better through this. I'm not just coming through, I'm coming up. Hallelujah, amen? Amen. (laughs) The trial's turning into a triumph. The setbacks are set up to take us where we've never been before. Get ready, church. Get your life ready. And God is saying to Cornerstone, be ready. You haven't seen anything yet. Let's stand, church. These altars are open. You've got a God that's bursting at the seams to pour out His goodness on you. All you got to do is come, cup up, hearts open, ready. The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro this congregation, looking to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal, committed, and devoted to Him. Come today.